Good evening, everyone. Today is Wednesday, September 25th. Welcome to Vice Rye News, where we cover interesting stories that the news cycle seems to be missing out on. I realized after launching last week's installment that I haven't really explained exactly what I'm doing here. I just kind of dropped it on you guys without warning, thinking it all made sense because it made sense to me. So here's what this is. On Wednesdays, I will be releasing a news show featuring a different guest host every week. We're going to cover four news items that haven't necessarily been getting a lot of press, mostly focusing on science-related topics. I will still be doing my regular videos on Fridays, and the Friday videos are the only ones that patrons will be charged for. And now to mention the elephant in the room. Yes, I am sick. Because of course I'm sick on recording day, so sorry for my sniffles. And joining me today, I have Rachel of the YouTube channel X Cult Baby. Good evening, Rachel. Good evening. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your YouTube channel? So I am an ex Jehovah's Witness activist. I am also an atheist. And I, as interested as I am in science, my channel is more based on theological stuff. I started off my channel just making videos about the Bible because when I deconverted, the first thought that I had was like, oh my gosh, these. Bible stories are awful. How did I read these and think that they were great? So that was the first thing that I started doing. And since then, I've done a lot more. I've done stuff specifically about, you know, being an ex Jehovah's Witness and what being a witness was like. Um, I recently started doing response videos. So um, my channel is pretty diverse and I'm, I'm only had it for less than a year. But yeah, it's going pretty good. Yeah. So X Cult Baby is a great addition to the atheist and skeptical YouTube community, so I highly recommend you go check it out. She's still got less than a thousand subscribers, guys. Let's get her up there. Yes, right. please. <laughs> so, X Cult Baby, I hear CRISPR is entering its first human trials. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, first, I figured I should actually explain what CRISPR is for anybody that doesn't know. <clears throat> so it's an acronym that stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. So the repeats are small copies of viruses found in the DNA of bacteria. The bacteria use the copies of the viruses in their DNA to identify and target viruses that are bad for them. So then the bacteria release an enzyme called Cas9 that's capable of cutting up DNA to cut up the viruses. So since about 2012, scientists have been using CRISPR and Cas9 to alter DNA. So they can essentially cause whatever mutations they want from the Cas9 making cuts in DNA. So it's basically genetic surgery. Yeah, pretty much. It's definitely the most precise way we have gene editing right now. There have been other things that have been tried, but that's the most precise. It's still not, you know, 100%. Don't get me wrong. But it's the most precise method we have now. And we've been finding a lot of success with it so far. Um, CRISPR-Cas9 has been used on animals. Uh, it's basically created pigs that are immune to a deadly disease that's been wiping out pigs. And wow. it's even been used to make sterile salmon for farming so that if the salmon happen to escape the farm, they won't be able to breed with wild salmon. Oh, that's amazing. Right. So these salmon using the CRISPR-Cas9 have been altered so that they just like, basically they don't have uh, reproductive genitalia essentially is what my understanding is. I could be slightly wrong about my interpretation of that, but yeah, so they've had a lot of success using animals, using this on animals. And now we are finally at the point where we're trying to go into human trials. So researchers at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia are using it to treat two cancer patients using immune cells that have been programmed with CRISPR to target cancer cells. So all of this is in the process right now. There's another human trial that involves trying to cure sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. Both of these diseases are caused by defects in the gene for hemoglobin, which you know is the is in your red blood cells. It's the part that carries oxygen. So fetuses have a form of hemoglobin that grabs extra oxygen. And normally the body stops producing this fetal hemoglobin after birth, but some people have a genetic variant that makes them continue to produce this special type of hemoglobin their whole lives. And those people, even if they have the genetic defects for sickle cell disease or beta thalassemia, they won't get the diseases because they have 
that um, special hemoglobin. So the companies Vertex and CRISPR Therapeutics are trying to replicate that fetal hemoglobin effect using CRISPR and Cas9 in people with those um, those genetic defects. Oh, that's that's interesting. Um, now I don't know if the research touched on this, but um, I know sickle cell anemia uh, actually gives people a certain resistance to malaria. So even if you're carrying it, but you never develop uh, actual sickle cell disease, um, if you're a carrier of the gene, your hemoglobin will still be just a little bit misshapen, and then the uh, malaria can't latch onto that. So, um, do, do you know if the it, like the fetal hemoglobin, if you continue to have that into adulthood, will that still, uh, will you still be immune to malaria or is this? It didn't say in the article, nor did I think it say in the paper, but I, the way that it sounds like the um, treatment works, it doesn't sound like it would actually affect uh, the genetic uh, changes that cause the disease. It just is trying to basically cause that fetal hemoglobin to still be produced by the body. So I don't think that it would change your regular hemoglobin, but it would produce another kind of hemoglobin is, is my understanding. Okay, so it might be a, might be a case of the best of both worlds, mm -hmm. uh, but it also might be that uh, the fetal hemoglobin would be susceptible to uh, malaria. Mm. That's, yeah, not that's sure about that. Question. I, I think further research needs to be done for that one. Yeah, but, I, um, I had no idea about the malaria thing. That's interesting. So sickle cell disease is uh, one of those genetic diseases where you basically, if you have two parents that are carriers of it, and they have a child, that child has a 50% chance of developing the disease. But if they don't develop the disease, they will still carry the genetic material for it. And so even if you do not have the disease, if you just have the mutation that causes the disease in some cases, your uh, hemoglobin is still just, just a little tiny bit misshapen, so malaria has more trouble with that, those ones. That's, that's why it's such a successful mutation in areas that are riddled with malaria, hmm. uh, because the benefits of not getting malaria as a child outweigh the consequences of having sickle cell disease, generally speaking, because you, you don't necessarily have symptoms of the disease, so the uh, selection pressures work to uh, basically promote this mutation. Yeah, that, so. that gene wouldn't necessarily have gotten weeded out because it does have some benefits. Interesting. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe in the future we'll... Uh, another application of CRISPR might be to, uh, like, if, if the people with the fetal hemoglobin are still susceptible to malaria, maybe a future iteration will cause the fetal hemoglobin to shape like the sickle cell carriers that don't have the disease, but will be able to stop them from getting sickle cell anemia. Hmm. I don't know. That sounds like it might be a bad idea. <laughs> well, if it's possible, that would be great, though, right? Yeah, it, it, it would. But as I was saying that, I just kind of thought that like, okay, we'll, this might be introducing sickle cell disease to people that were previously healthy. So maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe it's not the way to go. It's a little risky, a little bit. <laughs> okay. But there, there, was another, uh, there was another experiment that they're doing with this as well, is there not? Right. Um, yeah. So there also, there's a company called Adidas Medicine, and they're going to be using CRISPR and Cas9 to try basically to cure a form of blindness that's caused by a mutated gene. So this gene mutation basically causes the rods, I believe it is, in your in your eyes to just die. So that's obviously causes people to be blind, but essentially this um this CRISPR Cas9 would be able to restore some of that sight by repairing some of those genes. And basically, they would be injecting this directly into the eyes of the patients. And then this has actually been somewhat successful already on animals. Um, there's been some amount of success when this method has been tested on monkeys and mice. So, yeah, here's we're hoping it works for us, too. Yeah, so it looks like they're, they're actually trying to basically cure a genetic blindness, which is pretty awesome like could you could you imagine being one of those adults who's never seen your entire life and then getting yeah. a genetic tr genetic therapy like this and uh, then suddenly being able to see T to be honest that sounds extremely overwhelming i'm not even sure if i would want that which you know doesn't sound super positive because you know like hey we're out here curing blindness but like i feel like 
vis- vision is such a huge sensory input that if going your entire life without that and then suddenly having it would be kind of crazy. It'd be like walking from a dark room into the bright sunlight for basically your entire existence? Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, when starting with human trials, they're starting with adults and giving them informed consent right. and stuff like that. So once they determine that it's safe in adults, the next step is to start trying this on uh, children. So they're potentially young enough that they can get used to being able to see again. But, you know, I've, I've, never, I've never had any of my senses deprived for an extremely long amount of time. So I don't know how I would respond to that. I would, I would think it would be a good thing. But uh, yeah, you're right. The, like a, a blind person who has lived their entire life blind is used to being blind. So it might be a huge adjustment for them and not necessarily always in a positive way. But it's, it's still pretty awesome. And, yeah, you know, cochlear implants to uh, help with deafness, that those are now very commonplace. Uh, it's like a standard treatment now, uh, whereas in the past, like that was the thing of science fiction. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. if you think about it, if you have a cochlear implant, you're basically a cyborg. <laughs> and I mean that in a good way. I I used to be pretty involved in the deaf community. I'm like fluent-ish in American Sign Language, and I would say that most deaf people would take that as a compliment. Okay, <laughs> that's good because I I didn't mean it as because uh, I know sometimes cyborgs are made out to be mm. the bad guys. But yeah, they think it was cool. I would I would think it was cool. All right, so moving on. A study finds that air pollution particles can get inside the placenta. Okay, so this study was published in Nature Communications, and it found black carbon particles that were inside the placenta, which, if you're not familiar with it, is the organ that provides a baby with oxygen and nutrients from the mother. Uh, It essentially acts as a filter between the mother and the baby, trying to keep the baby safe, but make sure the baby gets everything that it needs. Uh, Now, black carbon is linked to cancer, respiratory, and cardiovascular diseases, as well as birth defects. The black carbon was found on both the fetal and maternal side of the placenta, which is a problem because of what I said earlier, the placenta is essentially acting as a filter, keeping the baby healthy. So finding it on the fetal side suggests that it might be able to cross the placenta. And uh, it was found on placentas as early as 12 weeks, which is early enough to potentially affect organ development in the fetus. This is an example of uh, how... Going green with green electricity and green cars and things like that, zero emissions, uh, it can be helpful even if you don't believe that climate change is man-made. Mm-hmm. Uh, like air pollution, uh, there, was a, there was a study in MIT that uh, determined air pollution from power generation causes 52,000 premature deaths every year. And an analysis published in 2016 put the total societal cost for air pollution in the U.S. alone at $131 billion in 2011, which was actually down from $175 billion in 2002. Oh, jeez. So that's, that's a lot of money, and that's people going to the doctor for stuff that's related to, uh, to pollution. And the primary source of these costs is power generation, so that's the mining of coal, the burning of coal, um, just dirty power, basically. So pushing for clean energy and zero-emission vehicles is often seen as too expensive with no perceptible benefit by the people who deny human-caused climate change. But even if humans are not causing causing climate change, um, transitioning to clean energy and clean transportation would drastically decrease the illnesses that result from that. It would drastically increase millions of people's qualities of life, and it would result in a significant reduction in annual health care costs. But um, people are saying it's too expensive. It's, It's too expensive not to. Yeah, I don't understand. Even if it was a matter, like like you're saying, even if it was a matter of expense, the amount of people that are spending money on trying to get well because of pollution is too much. I mean, realistically, it doesn't. It, if there is a clean thing to do, if there is a version that doesn't cause pollution, why would you not take that option, regardless of climate change? I mean. Climate change shouldn't even be a factor in that, I, I think. I think that that's not even, I mean, obviously, uh, the imminent uh, inhabitability of Earth is a horrible idea. But even right now, I mean, why would you not want a cleaner Earth, a cleaner home, and to make people more healthy? That just seems yeah, like, intuitive. 
heaven forbid we fight climate change and then it turns out climate change wasn't a thing and we accidentally made the world a better place without having a big specter looming over our heads yeah exactly doesn't really make a whole lot of sense but in the article there was some mention that they weren't sure whether or not the black carbon that was on the fetal side of the placenta actually did have a negative impact so more research definitely needs to be done there because they weren't really sure what impact if any there was from that but even so i think the fact that it was there at all is really alarming whether or not it actually can do anything just knowing that that yeah. much of the stuff that's in the air can get into the placenta is really yeah, so alarming ju just the fact that it was found on the placental side doesn't necessarily mean that it made it all the way to the fetus like that could have just been the last stage of the filtering uh, but it definitely needs more study to determine what the effects are on these kid on these babies is <laughs> and like you you'll also uh like again going back to the pollution thing it's the people who can't afford to live in clean areas they live in these poor polluted neighborhoods that they they also can't afford the health care that they need as a result of where they live so it's kind mm -hmm. of a catch-22 for them yeah I'm and thank also, you oh go ahead i was just gonna say before i forget to mention this i also want to mention that um nuclear energy it gets a bad rap uh i think a huge chunk of that is thanks to the simpsons with <laughs> mr burns being the big evil nuclear energy guy dumping his waste in the lake and causing the fish to mutate and everything but nuclear energy is actually one of the cleanest forms of energy that we can have all right so nuclear energy is a clean energy and especially the most recent reactors can actually burn the waste products from previous reactors and then the waste that they produce when the, when they put it at the bottom of these uh these disposal lakes Water is such a good absorber of radiation that you could go swimming at the uh, surface of the lake and you are being exposed to less radiation than someone standing on the surface of the planet at any given location. Just because of how much background radiation there is, the fact that you're submerged in water is filtering out the background radiation and you're not getting any of the radiation from the stuff at the bottom of the lake. Hmm. Like We send divers down into those lakes in just normal wetsuits. Wow. So, I did not realize that. Yeah, so nuclear energy is actually something that, like, it, it's something that we have, and people are pushing to shut down these reactors. But no, it's it's a very important part of our of our infrastructure at the moment. Yeah, there should definitely be more of that, and less of basically burning anything. Okay, but next up, we have uh, AIs can learn real world skills by playing video games. Does this mean they're going to uh, conquer us at some point? Well, they're definitely going to conquer us in the gaming industry. I can totally see that happening. Um, the article starts off actually talking about a AI called Alpha Star beating a professional gamer at the game StarCraft II. Now, I've never played StarCraft II, so I don't know a whole lot about it. But according to the article, the game mechanics involve basically controlling an entire fleet of ships um, and destroying the other teams ships presumably yeah, I, getting getting I, their I territory have, i have not played it either but i believe it's one of those games where you like you mine for resources and then you use those resources to build your uh army of ships and soldiers and stuff and whatnot right and, uh, so it, it's a real-time strategy game you have to you have to think about how you're managing your resources and how you're like are you going to focus on defense are you going to focus on offense do you mm -hmm. attack soon or do you hold back and prepare a lot to attack like it's there, there's a lot of strategy involved in that game that uh, right. computers often have a hard time with yeah and i mean i have a hard time with that i tried to play league of legends once and i i just could not grasp what was happening i i have no like i just i i, I have no talent for real-time strategy but the thing about machines is that you could pretty much teach them anything with the right kind of programming so they're having this AI play this game, and obviously the, the AI has gotten pretty good at it because, you know, it's going around defeating actual gamers. And it's not just for fun. I mean, as interesting as that is in and of itself, it's not just for fun because these kinds of skills, this kind of um, team coordination and, and real-time strategy can be used to complete complex tasks like 
I believe one of the things that they wanted to apply it for was kind of like controlling traffic because, you know, you have to look at it's, it's a big field and you have to look at all these different moving parts at the same time. But, you know, the, the, the type of thinking that you would need to use to do that is very similar. Now, when we say controlling traffic, are we talking controlling the traffic lights or are we talking self-driving cars? I, I think we're talking more like, um, not, not self-driving cars, because if we were talking about self-driving cars, that's a bunch of individual units, you know, and those, units need to be able to act independently because it's not like there's some giant network that every car could be hooked up to that would be working in real time that would, you know, work. I don't think that we have anything near the technology to do something like that. But in that case, if we're talking about, you know, um, individual units that all kind of have to figure each other out, a game like Minecraft would be a lot better to make this big picture plan of how to tackle issues and to continuously learn. So yeah, there, there is another AI that uh, researchers have set up playing Minecraft, which is a game that I play. So I actually do at least understand it a little bit. They've been using, um, they basically set up some rooms and things like that and give the AI a task to do, like um, to pick up a specific object but that they would put some obstacles in its way. So it has to figure out how to navigate the world. The same as basically if you, if you just gave somebody the game Minecraft and we're like, okay, I'm not going to tell you a whole lot about how it works, except here are the controls, you know, here's jump, here's this, here's that. Now, you know, go do whatever you want. The, the only difference is obviously that they are giving the AI specific tasks to complete. Whereas obviously a human player would just do whatever they wanted. But either way, you kind of have to learn how to use the game and adapt to a changing environment. So that continuous learning process is something that's very unique for AI. And it's kind of, kind of a new thing, it seems like. According to this article, that's very much a unique skill that's being learned there. Yeah, well, my first thought when I read this article was, uh, I remember an article that I read years and years and years ago when I was still living at home, trying to make excuses for why I should be allowed to play more video games. And <laughs> I was about how playing racing games can actually make you a better driver. Hmm. So study, more studies since then have expanded the scope, and they've uh, included general action games. So they're fast-paced games that force you into quick decisions, and they actually make you better at making these quick decisions in the real world. You know, if this can be applied to humans and us playing video games can actually cause us to learn real world skills in these video games, why would it not also apply to AIs? Right, exactly. I I don't see why not. I mean, clearly it's it's teaching them some skills that I would I would hope could be used later. Like for example, I think in the article they were talking about how let's say you have like a maid robot or something like that. And it's, you know, there's, there's an object in front of it or furniture gets rearranged in the home or something like that. It does need to be able to adapt to changing environment while still being able to complete tasks. At the same time, you also have to teach it, okay, you can't just go around breaking items. You have constraints in which you are allowed to solve these problems and all of that needs to be programmed in. But all of that would be useless, basically, if you can't teach the AI to learn and adapt. Like you, you can't really program in all of the possible circumstances that it would face. So you have to teach it how to learn and adapt itself. Yeah. Otherwise our, that'd be totally useless. Our robot overlords are just around the corner. Yeah. But I think, I, I think that if we're good teachers, they won't be so bad. Well, I'm, I'm not terribly concerned about this AI singularity that people talk about because I, I think, I think the AIs that we're designing right now are far too specialized to develop mm -hmm. any sort of consciousness because they're, like, they're, like the AI we make to drive a self-driving car, it knows only what it needs to know to drive cars. It's not going to, you know, suddenly just connect to the internet and start reading, you mm -hmm. know, 8 We're not going to have an Ultron situation. No, I, I don't think so. Not, not soon, anyway. Yeah. I think... <laughs> 
I'm, I'm sure at some point somebody's going to be like, well, what if we did create artificial consciousness and they're going to make something like that? And that there's a whole pile of ethical issues on with that one. But I think that's much further down the road. Yeah, I don't think that that is a problem we will be tackling anytime soon. And it's probably a good thing because right now we have to worry about climate change. I don't want to have to worry about the AI apocalypse. Yeah. Okay, so last on the docket today, we've got two asteroids collided in deep space, sparking an ancient ice age. That's the uh, headline. It's not really deep space. It's the inner solar system. But uh, I guess for us, that's kind of deep space because it's further away than humans have ever been. Okay, so there's a new study that was published in Science Advances, and it's determined that an asteroid collision is quite possibly a contributing factor to, if not the actual cause of, the mid-Ordovician Ice Age. So there's a mineral called L-crondite, which is found in meteorites, and these meteorites have been traced back to this asteroid collision that happened some 446 million years ago. It is the largest documented asteroid breakup in the last 3 billion years. So yes, it's even bigger than the Ross and Rachel breakup. Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't even watch Friends. <laughs> but I know that one. Uh, so meteorites from this collision still make up about a third of all the meteorite impacts today, and this study has examined the mineral content of these strata from about the time of the impact, and they found that it correlates very closely to a major fall in sea levels, which is usually indicative of an ice age. Now, the ice age from that time period peaked in the late Ordovician, but this fall in sea levels could indicate that the ice age was actually beginning in the mid-Ordovician period. The idea here is that dust from the collision was accumulating in the Earth's atmosphere in the few hundred thousand years after the collision, and this triggered a very, very slow decrease in the Earth's temperature. The changing of the climate then triggered a massive speciation event known as the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event, or the GOBE. GOBE? G-O-B-E. So the key here is that the climate shifted, which then caused an increase in selection pressures, but it happened so gradually that it did not cause a mass extinction. So we potentially have an asteroid impact that caused such a gradual cooling of the Earth that it resulted in a massive biodiversification event. And also, if you read through the study, it's got some really neat details about how they date fossilized meteorites. Along with the normal dating methods, they can also find out how long the meteorite was separated from its parent body by measuring the solar wind implanted ions of helium and neon. They can also measure how long the meteorite was exposed to cosmic rays between breaking off from its parent body and landing on Earth. So there's a lot of really cool science in here. That just, it ties so many different fields together. Like we've got geology, we've got astronomy, we've got radiometric dating. And it's, it's just amazing to me that they can look at a fossilized meteorite that's been sitting in the ground for 400 million years. They can pull it out, examine it, and determine that like, oh yeah, this is from that asteroid collision that we've already determined happened based on the meteorites that we see today. And uh, this is how long ago that asteroid collided, and this is how long this particular meteorite was exposed to cosmic rays in between the collision and falling to Earth. It, it's a really cool study that just brings so many different fields together. I love this sort of thing. It's only a cool study if you're a huge nerd. That's all I'm going to say about that. No, I'm just kidding. Well, um, I mean, I, I am, so. Yeah, that's, that's fair. And I'm a nerd, too. It's just that this isn't ex these, none of these are my fields of expertise or specific interest. But I think that it's really interesting that this cooling process was so gradual that it didn't cause a mass extinction event. And, you know, gradual cooling could be something that we would need right now, you know, with yeah. with climate change. So I think that more research definitely needs to be done and maybe how maybe something like this could be applied. So what I, you're saying I is we no need idea. to nuke an asteroid. Uh, I'm saying more research needs to be done before we nuke the asteroids. Get two birds with one stone. We could get rid of all our nuclear bombs on the Earth by launching them into space and blowing up a bunch of asteroids. <laughs> well that yeah we could no. do that <laughs> no, but that it would be... definitely it would definitely be smart to uh figure out exactly what effect that might have now because it's not like i don't know it's not it's not like the asteroid that initially caused the um the ice age would have been i mean it wasn't an incident that was caused it just happened to happen and happened to not uh destroy everything and make everything worse it happened to make everything better but if we can figure out you know exactly what kinds of conditions caused that maybe there's some way that we can replicate those conditions maybe not the actual asteroid destroying but you know some of the conditions that the asteroid caused 
no, nuking the asteroids is actually a really bad idea, especially if, like if if there's that's that's one of the that's one of the things about um all these like movies like Armageddon and Deep Impact and stuff like that. That's one of the options that they always go to is like, oh, why don't we just nuke the thing? It's like, okay, well, if you nuke the thing, then you have the same mass hitting the Earth, but it's spread out over a big, much wider distance, so it actually causes more damage. Yeah, more so surface area. Yeah, so if we're nuking something that would actually impact the Earth, that's a, that's not a good idea. You want to nudge it out of the way. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there are any big bodies that, if they were to have a collision, would be somewhere where we would collect their dust. And not, you know, have any major impacts. Because that would be that that would be yeah, let's, not so good. <laughs> let's let's create. Well, yeah, that that was um, that's actually one of the hypotheses for the GOBE. Uh, biodiversification thing is that um, there there were an increase in asteroid impacts after this collision for several hundred thousand years, and um, so that was one of the previous hypotheses was that these asteroid collisions were so mild, I guess, like they're they're not actually mild because it's an asteroid hitting the Earth, but in comparison to say the uh, the Yucatan, the one that hit the Yucatan Peninsula that wiped out the dinosaurs, compared to that, it was so mild that it like you know, it would wipe out these animals, and then that causes a new diversification event, and then another one comes in and wipes out these animals on the other side of the planet, and that creates another biodiversification event. So it, it could have been that working in tandem with the cooling temperatures. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, it didn't... Th I mean, I guess I really can't be surprised, because, you know, obviously, if there's anything that evolution is good at, it's adaptation. So it's not like it doesn't make sense that you know, all that adaptation would occur. It's just, you know, to think, because obviously I cannot mentally grasp the millions of years that this time frame is taking place over. So in my head, it's just like, wow, that's, that's fast. You know, they didn't all die. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it is quite interesting. And that's it for the news items. Now it's time for the history lesson of the day. On September 25th in the year 1690, the first ever multi-page newspaper to be published in the America was published for the first time. It was called Public Occurrences, Both Foreign and Domestic. And it was published once before it went out of business. <laughs> oh. It was the first, the first and last time this newspaper published, and it marked a moment in history of the first time a multi-page newspaper was published in, in <laughs> any of the American continents. But evidently it wasn't, uh, it, it didn't seem historic at the time. No, I guess nobody liked it. Yeah. <laughs> or may, maybe... Uh, you know what? I think back in the day, I think publishing a newspaper was kind of like YouTubing today. So like everybody did it once, <laughs> and but only a few people actually stuck to it. That's so, actually an interesting way to put it. I I have I I'm gonna admit something. I have seen every single episode of Doctor Quinn, Medicine Woman. I've never even heard of that. It's it was a show from the '90s. Uh, it was about a female doctor in the 1800s, and that was one of the little tangent storylines they had was uh one of the women in the town set up her own newspaper and was, you know everybody kind of looked at it as like oh yeah she's just making her newspaper or whatever and so that's just like it, it, as a youtuber now it's very reminiscent of what happens at youtube where everybody starts something and very few people have the tenacity to actually follow through with it now of course being like she was one of the good guys on the show so she did follow through with it but it was very hard at the beginning sort of thing Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's probably what that's probably exactly what happened with this. It was someone got a big idea to start a newspaper, so they printed it out and then didn't it meet with immediate success, so they gave up. Yep, that's that's what we call a quitter. Although Ooh. to be fair, to be fair, it takes more resources to publish a newspaper than it does to publish a YouTube video. Yeah, uh YouTube does make it well, I'm not gonna say easy for us, but it's easier than publishing <laughs> it, a newspaper. It at least makes it free. Yes. That's definitely something. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, X Cult Baby. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. I was super excited to get the invite. I don't know if I made that clear or not in text form, but I'm like super honored to have been featured on your channel. Um, you, your channel is one of the first ones that I saw when I was deconverting because it was just what my fiance watched all the time and. That was where I really got exposed to a lot of the more science-y stuff, learning about evolution. So thanks for that. Well, thank you so much. So remember to check out her channel, link in the description, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>